Hi everyone, my name is Natalie Morgan and I am the Oncology Pharmacy Resident here at Monument Health Cancer Institute. And for my clinical pearl this month, I am going to be talking about a position statement from the American Heart Association looking at drug interactions, specifically in the realm of cardio-oncology. And I chose this topic because I recently had the opportunity to go to a pharmacy conference where they discussed this new position statement that was released this year. And I think it's an interesting collaboration between both cardiology and oncology experts. And so I wanted to talk more about this position statement. My objectives are to first broadly define drug interactions and, and what they can mean for, for drug therapy, and then specifically look at drug interactions between our cardiology and oncology medications, specifically based on pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic parameters. And then wanted to finish by talking about some of the important supportive care considerations for, for drug interactions. So this, as I mentioned, is the Cardio-Oncology Drug Interactions uh, position statement from the American Heart Association. It was published in circulation earlier this year. So first off, how did this position statement define a drug interaction? So they defined a drug interaction as a pharmacological or clinical response to either the administration or co-exposure of a medication with another substance that will modify the patient's response to therapy. And this can be either in a beneficial or a detrimental manner. The position statement breaks down drug interactions into pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic uh, processes, and so that's kind of how I will break down this presentation as well. So pharmacodynamic, this is the pharmacological effect of a medication that is altered by another medication, and typically this is the result of drugs with mechanisms that have the same physiological outcome. So generally we have three potential outcomes where we can see a, a synergism, where we see a higher response from either medication than we would expect alone. We can see an additive where we just see simply the sum of the expected outcomes of each medication, or it can be antagonistic where we see a decrease in response um, with, with the result of co-administration. And then for our pharmacokinetic drug interactions, so this is where there's some alteration in our four-step pharmacokinetic process of absorption, distribution, metabolism, or elimination. And they covered briefly the four, the four steps um, in the pharmacokinetic process. So absorption is how a drug moves from the site of administration into systemic circulation. Of course, with a lot of our traditional chemotherapy being IV, this is not as much of a consideration, but as more and more oral chemotherapy comes to into the therapeutic regimens, this certainly is a significant consideration. Distribution is the, the free fraction, the unbound portion of the, of the drug that is actually available to reach target tissues, bind to target tissues, and have that, that pharmacological effect. And then we have metabolism, which is the body's breakdown of these potentially toxic and foreign compounds, which occurs primarily in the liver. Phase one of metabolism is where we see our cytochrome P450 or CYP enzymes that are responsible for about two thirds of all drug metabolism. However, the article does talk about how phase two metabolism sometimes gets overlooked and the UGT enzyme in particular that transfers glucuronic acid to other compounds is particularly important in phase two metabolism. And I'll talk more about that coming up, but in particular, our sacituzumab gobotecan and arenotecan are two of our chemotherapies that are metabolized primarily by UGT. And then for elimination, we have the excretion from the body as either an unchanged drug or as a product of metabolism. This is the visual that they included looking at on the left are pharmacokinetic drug interactions and then on the right are pharmacodynamic. Um, and so I'll go through each of these more in, in depth, but I kind of appreciated the, the broad visual overview.
So in terms of their goal with this position statement, um, there's a couple important factors that they discuss. First off, that the field of cardio-oncology is rapidly evolving. And so we have patients with uh, cancer as well as those that have cardiovascular risk factors. And so together, these patients are gonna be exposed to complex medication regimens from both cardiology as well as oncology, and this definitely increases the risk for potential drug interactions. The authors also discussed how with the rapid approval of so many new oncology drug therapies, often you know, important or relevant drug interactions may not be known or, or commonly understood until the drug has come to market and we've used it for a while, so important um, to recognize. And so the goal of this statement is to help clinicians by giving an overview of both crucial and, and critical drug interactions as well as our common drug interactions. And they also mentioned as well just the, the complexity of these regimens, as, as I mentioned, you know, with cardiology as well as oncology, and often there can be variability between patients. These drugs may have narrow therapeutic index as well as a steep um, curve in terms of dose versus toxicity, so important, important interactions. So I'm moving into our pharmacodynamic drug interactions. I wanted to start by talking about hypertension, and this is actually the most common cardiovascular comorbidity observed in patients with cancer. And interestingly, it's actually so more prevalent in patients with cancer, but also more prevalent among uh, cancer survivors than the general uh, population as well. So it's considered the primary modifiable risk factor for preventing our adverse cardiac outcomes among patients with cancer, as well as survivors. Some of our anti-cancer medications that are associated with hypertension, particularly our VEGF inhibitors, so incidence of 21 to 40% in first-time users, and this is thought to be due to a decrease in nitric oxide production. And blood pressure control during VEGF therapy has been shown to improve actually the overall prognosis with cancer as well as cardiovascular outcomes. We also have abiraterone, one of our antiandrogens that is associated with hypertension. Incidence ranges from 3.3 to 36.7%. And abiraterone is, is given with prednisone to prevent mineralocorticoid excess, you know, which can include hypertension and hypokalemia. But interesting that they discussed in this study that uh, looking at a study looked at incidence of hypertension with either the daily prednisone dosing or the twice daily prednisone dosing with abiraterone. And they actually found a higher rate of hypertension among the once daily prednisone dosing. So they concluded based on that study that really abiraterone is probably the main culprit in terms of causing hypertension because they did not see a significant difference with that, that change in, in prednisone dosing. Our mTOR inhibitors are also associated with, with uh, hypertension and then non-cancer, non but NSAIDs um, certainly are kind of a hidden culprit for hypertension, and all NSAIDs at, at doses high enough to have an anti-inflammatory effect can be associated with hypertension. So in terms of management of hypertension, um, as you can see on the left, we have our, our drug therapy classes and then what we would do for surveillance in the middle category, as well as treatment and management. So you can see for a lot of these therapies, it's just close monitoring. Uh, for the Bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitors, I'll, I'll talk more about their risk for arrhythmias coming up. but important with them with blood pressure monitoring if the patient develops any symptoms as well to, to think about an EKG or cardiac monitoring due to that risk for causing atrial fibrillation as well. In terms of treatment and management, particularly with our VEGF inhibitors, um, there's been some thought that that renin-angiotensin-aldosterone renin system may be down-regulated by VEGF, so there is some thought that our RAS inhibitors like ACEs or ARBs may not be as effective. However, because of their renal protection and the risk for proteinuria with our VEGF inhibitors, they are still first-line therapy, 
but there is some thought that calcium channel blockers, particularly the dihydropyridines like amlodipine, may actually be more beneficial in terms of treating hypertension with VEGF inhibitors. So I thought that that was, that was definitely interesting. In terms of abiraterone, as we mentioned, um, giving it with concurrent steroids to prevent any adrenal insufficiency and that uh, risk for mineralocorticoid excess. And then in general, um, just uh, following hypertension guidelines for our NSAIDs, recommending alternative therapies such as acetaminophen and then renal monitoring as well. Moving on to cardiomyopathy. Um, so Typically, often we think of cardiac dysfunction as kind of notoriously associated with anthracyclines. And I thought for this position statement, it was interesting how they defined it, it was a little more stringently than I had heard. They defined cardiac dysfunction as a decline in the left ventricular ejection fraction by greater than 10% to a value below 53%. Um, and, and I had always thought it was 50%. So uh, that was a, an interesting uh, statement for me. So they think that this decline in ejection fraction is due to several different mechanisms, um, due to the topoisomerase 2 inhibition from anthracyclines, as well as the production of free oxygen radicals and then intercalation of the DNA. It is a dose-dependent effect, so typically with doxorubicin, lifetime dose of greater than 240 milligrams per meter squared is when we would be concerned about that. And then also important to think about what other chemotherapies the patient is receiving, as that can certainly further increase the risk for cardiotoxicity. Um, this includes trastuzumab, taxanes, and cyclophosphamide. And particularly trastuzumab, when given concurrently with doxorubicin, has been shown to increase the risk for heart failure by seven times compared to if trastuzumab is given alone. Uh, so it is recommended to administer these therapies sequentially and not concurrently due to that risk. And then interestingly, though, patients that are receiving dual HER2 therapy, um, such as pertuzumab and trastuzumab, that has actually not been shown to increase the risk for uh, heart failure. So definitely some interesting um, considerations there. Myocarditis is often attributed to our immunotherapy does have a low incidence rate of 0.04% to 1.14%. However, the mortality rate is quite high at 25 to 50%. And when immunotherapy is given in combinations, such as for patients with melanoma, that definitely increases the risk, nearly, nearly doubles the risk for myocarditis. So 4.7 times increased risk compared to monotherapy with our checkpoint inhibitors. Also, immunotherapy is being increasingly given in combination with our tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Um, so for like our, our BRAF BEC inhibitors often given. And there is uh, some thought that this may increase the susceptibility of those cardiomyocytes to inflammation related to immunotherapy and can increase the risk for cardiotoxicity. They did note in this, in this position statement, though, that typically the myocarditis will be noted early when it's given in combination, um, so often within the first two weeks of treatment. So in terms of management of cardiotoxicity as well as myocarditis, so looking at our anthracyclines um, given you know, with or without other agents with cardiac risk, important for surveillance to have an echocardiogram with global longitudinal strain, and then potentially monitoring our cardiac monitor our markers like troponin or BNP, as well as considering a cardiac MRI. For treatment and prevention, so um, you know we do have our standard cardioprotective medications like beta blockers or RAS inhibitors. And then dexrazoxane is an iron chelator that is approved for prevention of cardiotoxicity. If patients have a lifetime dose above 300 milligrams per meter squared of doxorubicin and they require continu continued therapy. Liposomal doxorubicin also is an option, has a lower rate of cardiotoxicity, and then potentially using an alternative anthracycline as well as continuous infusion of doxorubicin, um, such as like over 96 hours, has also been shown um, to help prevent the cardiotoxicity. For our myocarditis, is particularly looking at our immunotherapy, 
you know, making sure we discontinue therapy at any concern for myocarditis and initiate treatment with corticosteroids. For second line therapy, we have other immunosuppressives like tacrolimus and mycophenolate. And then there are more investigational therapies like abatacept as well for management. Next, wanted to talk about thrombosis. Um, so patients with cancer have four times an increased risk for, for VTE. Um, and then if they are receiving active treatment for their malignancy, that increases the risk by 6.5 times. So we have the Corona score that's been developed to help us identify these at-risk patients. And this is a score based on the cancer type and, and risk associated with the cancer type, as well as their pretreatment blood counts. So this includes their white blood cell count, the hemoglobin and platelet count, and then looking at patients that have obesity, so a BMI greater than 35. There's also certain cancer therapies that have an inherent risk for thrombosis. Um, this includes tamoxifen, cisplatin, and a lot of our VEGF inhibitors. Multiple myeloma is unique in that um, has some different scoring systems, particularly looking at risk for thrombosis with our immunomodulators or IMIDs. So the SAVE score is one that can be used um, to calculate risk for thrombosis associated particularly with our IMIDs. And it includes looking at you know, surgery within the last 90 days, if they have Asian race, history of a VTE, if they're elderly, so greater than or equal to 80 years of age, as well as their dexamethasone dose. There's also the IMPED score that can be used for newly diagnosed patients with multiple myeloma. But typically with our IMIDs and then um, dexamethasone, we do see a dose-dependent risk. So typically with our high-dose dexamethasone, which they defined as greater than or equal to 480 milligrams of dexamethasone per cycle, that will increase the risk for thrombosis. So typically we see low-dose aspirin given with our IMIDs. However, they do mention as well in this statement that uh, low molecular weight heparin for prophylaxis compared to aspirin did significantly decrease the risk for VTE. Um, so I thought that was an interesting statement. And then for our, our CLL as well as our ALL patients, we have ponatinib. And ponatinib actually was removed from the market briefly due to the risk for arterial thrombosis. And that's because of its effect on both VEGF as well as platelet-derived growth factor. It was able to be returned to the market, but aspirin prophylaxis is, is recommended. And then if the patient is hospitalized, um, low molecular weight heparin is recommended. Also, panatinib has some significant drug interactions with our antifungal agents where it can increase the drug levels of ponatinib. Um, so important to, to think about that with the risk for thrombosis as well. In terms of our treatment of thrombosis for our anticoagulant therapy, so the DOACs generally are, are safe, um, but there is a caveat with our GI malignancies, and this includes esophageal cancer. They've been shown to have a higher rate of bleeding in these malignancies, so we are going to prefer uh, low molecular weight heparin in comparison um, to, to DOACs for GI malignancies. And then in terms of antiplatelet therapy, so there's some interesting recommendations here, particularly for patients that are undergoing PCI and require uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. So the Society of Cardiovascular Angiography, um, they mention in this article, have some recommendations for modifications of DAFT for patients, particularly with a low platelet count, less than 50,000, and particularly um, looking at the type of PCI and then duration of, of dual antiplatelet therapy. So for balloon angioplasty, recommending two weeks for a bare metal stent, four weeks, and then a drug eluding stent, three to six months. However, the article also mentions that you know these, these guidelines were published in 2016. So often in practice for high-risk patients, they'll use dual antiplatelet therapy for a month and then switch to, to single antiplatelet therapy uh, due to that risk for her bleeding associated. And in particular, they mention uh, ibrutinib, one of our bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And in patients that receive dual antiplatelet therapy with ibrutinib, they mention that there's an increased risk for major bleeding by 40 to 50%.
So that brings me into the risk for, for bleeding. Um, so an episode of bleeding occurs in around 10% of patients with cancer, but up to nearly 30% of patients with a hematologic malignancy. And this can be due to a variety of factors. So it can be due to our, our chemotherapy regimens and, and myelosuppression, risk for thrombocytopenia. It can also be due to use of NSAIDs, as we just talked about, um, anticoagulant and antiplatelet use. And then some of our disease-specific things that are associated with higher risk for bleeding include our GI malignancies, patients with metastatic disease, or if they have renal or hepatic impairment. And so for patients that have cancer and require treatment with anticoagulants, they are at increased risk for bleeding um, when compared to, to age-matched cohorts, just, just in general. And the chemotherapy agents that are associated with bleeding risk particularly include bevacizumab, as well as ibrutinib, as, as we mentioned, one of our bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So for management of, of bleeding, um, so generally, you know, looking at our drug therapy classes, particularly our VEGF inhibitors and bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitors, um, important to monitor CBC closely and just look for any signs and symptoms of bleeding. Also, they mentioned interactions with warfarin and our fluoropyrimidines like fluorouracil and capecitabine. Um, so particularly important with warfarin to increase monitoring of the INR and then potentially decreasing the dose of warfarin. Also for supplemental therapies, uh, fish oil and vitamin E have been associated with an increased risk of bleeding, um, so recommended to use alternatives to fish oil. Next, I wanted to talk about cardiac arrhythmias, and arrhythmias can develop as both an on-target as well as an off-target effect, um, and particularly are going to be working at the cardiac myocytes. So these arrhythmias can include atrial fibrillation, as well as QT prolongation and torsades or, or bradycardia. And this can be due to potentially side effects of our treatment, you know, related to electrolyte imbalances from nausea or vomiting, as well as uh, decreased oral intake. And then we also have our supportive therapies that may increase the risk, particularly for QT prolongation. So our, some of our antidepressants and antiemetics. And then some of our targeted therapies are are certainly associated with QT prolongation, particularly ribocyclib, and then some of our other uh, TKIs such as lapatinib and, and nilotinib. I did want to include this Tisdale risk score for QT prolongation. Um, so this is a score used for hospitalized patients. So it's not validated for oncology patients, but I just think it's interesting looking at this score. This is predicting the risk for QT prolongation greater than 500 milliseconds or an increase of greater than 60 milliseconds from baseline. And just interesting to see the, the components that are part of this scoring. Um, so elderly patients as well as female gender, loop diuretics and hypokalemia, if they have a baseline QTC greater than or equal to 450 milliseconds, and in certain conditions such as acute MI, sepsis, or heart failure. Interesting though, uh, that I thought you can see looking at their concurrent use of other QT prolonging drugs. So one versus two or more is the same score, which I, I thought was interesting. I always kind of thought of a cumulative risk, but really based on this score, if they have another QT prolonging drug, it's the same risk. So that um, categorizes patients then into low, moderate, or high risk, again, based on their uh, risk for having that increase greater than 500 milliseconds. But again, this is not validated for oncology patients. And then in particular, looking at the QT uh, interval risk with certain therapies. Uh, so arsenic is going to have our highest risk has a box warning statement, and this has included cases of sudden cardiac death, um, so important to know there. And then doxorubicin also has a significant risk for increased QTC. Among our targeted therapies, ribocyclib, I think is one of our more notorious ones, um, so it was actually FDA approved based on stringent cardiac monitoring, so this includes an EKG at baseline, 
and then in the middle of, of cycle one, so at day 15, and then before the, the, the start of cycle two. And they actually recommend taking ribocyclib in the morning to uh, prevent, help prevent the increase in QT. Next, I wanted to move on to pharmacokinetic drug interactions. So in terms of our CYP enzymes, um, CYP3A4 and CYP2D6 are probably our two you know, biggest enzymes responsible for the majority of drug metabolism. But I, I think it's just helpful to look at um, you know, breaking it down by our cardiovascular drugs as well as our oncology drugs, and then where they fit in terms of a CYP substrate inhibitor and inducer, and then how we manage some of those drug interactions. So for CYP3A4, uh, for cardiovascular, the DOAX, including apixaban and rivaroxaban, as well as warfarin, um, should not be used with dual strong CYP3A4 and PGP inhibitors. So you can see idololysib um, falls into that category for oncology drugs. Um, not recommended to use. So apixaban in particular, not recommended to use with idololysib or ribocyclib. And then for our oncology drugs, so tamoxifen um, we'll talk more about, but is unique in that it is it uses both 3A4 and 2D6 um, pathways in terms of uh, metabolism and then uses 2D6 for activation to its active metabolite. So kind of unique pathway um, there. And then for CYP3A4 with venetoclax, so venetoclax requires dose reduction when it's given with moderate CYP3A4 inhibitors, as well as those that have dual PGP, as well as CYP3A4 inhibition. In terms of our CYP2D6, which is kind of, as I mentioned, the, the second big uh, CYP enzyme here. So for our cardiovascular medications, when certain um, substrates are given, such as flecainide or propafenone, important to monitor for bradycardia and, and widening of that QRS if they're concurrently given with CYP2D6 inhibitors. And you can see we have a pretty significant number of oncology medications that fall into uh, CYP2D6 inhibitors, including abiraterone and fedratinib. And then, as I mentioned, tamoxifen for oncology uses both CYP3A4 and CYP2D6. I'm not recommended to use tamoxifen, doxorubicin, or gefitinib with CYP2D6 inhibitors. And then, as I'll talk more about, also with uh, some of our antidepressants and tamoxifen, important to look at their CYP2D6 metabolism. And then moving on to our CYP2C9 metabolism, I included, <clears throat> excuse me, I included this one because of warfarin being one of the, the, the main substrates here. So as we mentioned, warfarin typically is not recommended to be given with fluoropyrimidines, um, such as fluorouracil or capecitabine. As you can see, those are CYP2C9 inhibitors, as well as tamoxifen. So um, certainly, if you do give warfarin, you need to monitor the INR closely. And then in terms of our oncology medications, so use of bortezomib, tamoxifen, and imatinib has not been studied with strong CYP2C9 inhibitors. And then recommended to not use tamoxifen with moderate CYP2C9 inhibitors or the patient may, may require dose reduction. And then the active metabolite of both cyclophosphamide and iphosphamide may be decreased when given with CYP2C9 inhibitors. CYP2C19, I included because of clopidogrel, which is a pro drug um, that requires activation by CYP2C19. So important to think about in terms of um, antiplatelet effect and recommended to avoid use of clopidogrel with tip CYP2C19 inhibitors. Um, you can see letrozole and cabozantinib fall into that category um, due to the potential where the clopidogrel will not be activated. So recommended to use other antiplatelets such as ticagrelor or prazugrel. And then for PGP metabolism, so our DOACs do fall into the substrates here, although apixaban has minimal, is a minimal uh, PGP substrate. 
but wanted to mention the Jackson here as a PGP substrate. So particularly looking at our anthracyclines, digoxin absorption has been shown to be decreased by up to 50% when given with anthracyclines. So therapeutic drug monitoring um, is recommended when, when given. And there's some discussion about what, what causes that interaction, but they think there may be an upregulation of PGP that causes more drug efflux. Um, and then also there can be intestinal epithelial toxicity just from the chemotherapy with anthracyclines that may prevent the absorption. However, they also talk about some of our liposomal uh, anthracycline formulations may have less of an impact on, on drug absorption. And then venetoclax comes up again. It is considered a PGP inhibitor, so may increase levels of PGP substrates. And then tucotinib is not listed in our oncology drugs, as you can see, but can increase the risk for bleeding with DOAX. Um, and this is thought to be due to PGP inhibition. In terms of our phase two UGT metabolism, um, as I mentioned, this is kind of one of the overlooked enzymes and, and related to, to metabolism, but did want to mention dibigatran. Um, so not recommended to use dibigatran with UGT 1A9 inhibitors or inducers. And you can see a lot of our chemotherapy agents do fall into that category, including lorlatinib and rigorafenib. And then in terms of our onco oncology medications, we do have some important considerations, particularly with uh, renotecan and secotuzumab. Their active metabolite is SN38. And patients that have decreased UGT 1A1 and 1A9 activity, so a, a lower ability to metabolize these drugs, may have increased toxicity where they have increased you know, neutropenia and side effects from, from that increased uh, circulation of the active metabolite. And then etoposide also comes into play here as a UGT uh, substrate. So in general, we don't want to give UGT substrates with UGT inhibitors. And then valinostat, uh, one of our lymphoma medications, also is recommended to have a 25% dose reduction, starting dose reduction, for patients that are homozygous for the UGT 1A1 star 2 8 allele. So important to know there. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of our supportive care, as I mentioned, that can increase risk as well as some important miscellaneous drug interactions. So for supportive care considerations, um, particularly with our antibiotic therapy and macrolides, clarithromycin and urethromycin are going to be strong CYP3A4 inhibitors. Azithromycin has minimal CYP3A4 activity, so would be the preferred macrolide. And then in terms of our antifungal therapy, fluconazole for our azoles has less CYP3A4 inhibition than other azoles. For glucuronidation, uh, this is important to think about with Tylenol. So uh, some of our TKIs, such as disatinib and imatinib, uh, may actually interact with Tylenol and affect that glucuronidation pathway. So these patients may actually have a lower maximum dose of Tylenol. And then for our analgesics, there are certain opioids that may be increased with with certain cancer therapies. So for instance, fentanyl, uh, morphine, and hydrocodone and oxycodone have been associated with uh, imatinib and nilotinib, and then tramadol levels may be increased with gefitinib. As I mentioned, tamoxifen is kind of unique in that it has both CYP3A4 and 2D6 pathways, and it is a prodrug, so requires CYP2D6 metabolism to be converted to its active metabolite in doxifen. So if we use it with strong CYP2D6 inhibitors, there's a risk that it may not be converted to the active metabolite. So particularly for our antidepressants, um, those that fall into the strong CYP2D6 inhibition category include bupropion, fluoxetine, and paroxetine, not recommended to be used with, with tamoxifen. And then you can see we have moderate and mild. So absolutely preferred would be those that have minimal CYP2D6 inhibition 
This includes mirtazapine, trazodone, and venlafaxine. Wanted to talk a little bit about absorption of our TKIs as well. Um, so majority of our TKIs are going to be weak bases, and they're going to require an acidic environment for uh, for adequate absorption. However, with cardiovascular risk and, and procedures, um, often patients are going to be prescribed acid suppressing medications, potentially for atrial fibrillation and anticoagulant use if they've had a GI bleed or potentially following a cardiac procedure. So important to think about, you know, does this patient need to continue on this therapy? Um, and is it appropriate for administration with the TKI? Is it something that can be separated with administration or, you know, is it absolutely contraindicated to be administered? TKIs that do require an acid environment in particular include disatinib, ibrutinib, and imatinib. And then last, um, just wanted to talk a little bit about our cardiovascular medications that do rely heavily on renal elimination. So this includes digoxin, dofetilide, sotalol, and atenolol. And important to think about this when given concurrently with some of our more nephrotoxic chemotherapy, such as cisplatin, and monitoring that renal function closely. And if that changes and worsens, um, potentially discontinuing or dose reducing their cardiovascular medications. So moving on to summary here. So in general, based on this cardio-oncology position statement, um, you know, significant drug interactions do exist between both cardiology and oncology drug therapy regimens. And it's important to recognize these because these are often complex regimens. And then we have this rapidly changing landscape of drug therapy in both cardiology as well as oncology. Most drug interactions can be categorized as either pharmacodynamic or pharmacokinetic, and recognition and management of these drug interactions can allow for either you know, closer monitoring or potentially a change in, in therapy. So the overall goal then of, of cardio-oncology uh, programs is to really help make sure that our cancer therapies are, are delivered effectively while also helping to mitigate both short and long-term cardiovascular effects. So these are my references, and thanks so much for listening to my clinical pearl for this month.